wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey, everybody. Welcome yet again to another edition of TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, as always, your Boston-based stand-up comedian, which I say in quotes as I haven't done stand-up in about six months, because we are still in the lockdown sessions, everybody, as well we should be. It's, uh, it is not safe out there. So, uh, unless I'm just crazy and this is like some weird Truman Show thing, uh, it doesn't seem like I should be leaving the house, but that's okay. I'm built for this. Anyway, this is TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, your TV Guidance Counselor. This is the show where each and every week since 2014, myself and a guest look through an old issue of TV Guide magazine from my personal collection and we talk about their viewing choices from that week. It's a lot of fun. I love doing it and I think you'll love hearing it if you haven't before if you're tuning in for the first time just to hear this interview with my guest which welcome to the show i think you'll enjoy it speaking of which my guest is the one and only actor writer director db sweeney and this is one of the guys i've wanted to talk to for a really long time he's actually one of the most requested guests for me to get on the show i'm so glad that he had some time to sit down and chat with me and i the guy's got great stories and we talk tv and it's a really good time before we get into the episode though i just want to thank you guys again for listening and i want to thank everybody who has reached out to me on email which you can do at tvguidanceconcertgmail.com or can at icanread.com I can read.com, of course, being my stand-up comedy page still. There's no dates on there because we're not doing anything live, but you can still go on there. You can buy TV Guidance Council merchandise or any of that kind of stuff that you may enjoy in your home, and I will ship that out to you. Uh, or that have con- contacted me via social media at TV Guidance at Kenneth W. Reed, R-E-I-D. Uh, gives to the Patreon, patreon.com backslash TV Guidance Counselor. Again, I cannot thank you guys enough. Thank you for listening to the show and for recommending it to people and uh it it keeps me going and it's given me something to do here in the lockdown other than just uh, have donuts delivered to my house and and sit and eat stacks of donuts like a cartoon dog uh i think that's a cartoon dog thing scooby-doo probably eats stacks of donuts someone can find me a gif i don't know anyway while you're doing that while you're searching for that gif of scooby-doo eating a stack of donuts you can listen to this fantastic episode of tv guidance counselor so please sit back relax and enjoy this week's episode of tv guidance counselor with my guest D. B. Sweeney. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time of need. D. B. Sweeney, how are you? I'm great. How you doing? Good. Thank you so much. I think you're my uh, you're my second via satellite episode from Chicago. Oh, nice. Yeah, you are. Uh, you are right behind Steve Albini. <laughs> okay. Great. So you're in good company. Um, but when we talked about doing the show, you were like uh, maybe mid seventies, seventy five. But you watched a lot of older stuff. Yeah, I, I did. I mean, I, I uh, and it's funny. It was it was amazing going back. I hadn't looked at a TV guide in twenty five years until you you know sent me the samples, and uh, it was an amazing thing that uh, that that is gone because I, I really like the little thumbnails they have in there and the guest cast, and you know, it's 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 really. Uh, it's way more than you get when you go on your guide now on TV. You know, when you go to the on-screen guide, you get nothing. Basically, you get yeah. if it's a rerun or a new episode. You know, they don't tell you who's in it, or they might tell you the stars, but they don't give you. So I really enjoy the you know thumbing through. Yeah, it was interesting too because you could always tell when the description of the episode was written by the network and as like a PR oh. thing, and when someone in TV Guide wrote it, and they get a little bitchy sometimes because they don't have to sign their name to it, which is always kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> totally they're like oh this is not a good show but without quite saying it um yeah but you know for for those of us because you grew up in long island i did yeah the east end of long island on the north shore uh, a little town called shoreham which in the summertime was probably six or seven thousand people and in the winter time maybe two thousand and we had uh millionaire row along the long island sound where all the people <laughs> who made money in the city and then came out and 
were rich people in the summer. And then the rest of us were sort of inland from the water and we just, you know, go down to the beach and go visit it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, having grown up, we used to spend the summers down in Narragansett, Rhode Island, which is where my family came from. And yeah, it's funny seeing the, the people who are there all year versus the uh, people right. who vacation. It's a, it's a real mix. The townies. Yes, right? exactly. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, the, plenty of Sweeney's of no relation around here. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But one of the things that I always noticed, especially in that time, and I think I gave you an issue from Colorado, which is Central Time, but the movies, like as a movie fan, which I assume you were (laughs) growing up, you have that movie guide. And that would be the first thing I would go through every week where I'm like, what movies can I watch this week? Even if I have to get up at 3 a.m. to watch something on WPIX, you know, what is it? (laughs) Yeah, I wonder wonder how the, uh, there must have been much more generous terms uh, for show it because there's some great movies on in the middle of the night and now Mm -hmm. nobody would ever do that because you'd save it for a prime slot or you know if it was a broadcast slot or you know and even netflix and places like that don't have as many of the great old movies because i guess the terms aren't uh, advantageous anymore but they must have been then i wonder if they just uh, i think they were probably cheap then because movies didn't have like pre vcr there was no value to owning right. to being able to show a movie because they're like we might re-release this in theaters maybe we made our money it's fine right. and you know the stuff that we saw growing up which was this education in the whole first 50 years of entertainment was just because it was cheap like we saw the bowery boys and universal monster movies because it didn't it cost them almost nothing right. to air those <laughs> but so i i think now it's less um everything has a price on it and everybody has their perceived value for their, for for their content. And it's, it's gone extreme where it's either all content is free and we have to do stuff for free (laughs) that are out there, or it's a ton of money. And and there's no like, Oh, we just got this package of movies. We'll just show them whenever. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I I definitely miss uh, seeing the old movies and, you know, like last night I, I rented the movie, the outpost, which was pretty good, but you know, it was like eight bucks. And I thought, I don't think that was eight bucks worth of movie. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, I would have rather watched, uh, you know, an old uh, episode of Rat Patrol or something <laughs> right. in, in the night. Well, you probably can. I think it's streaming somewhere, although I don't know if Rat Patrol is streaming. Um, I've never found it, but I'm going to check tonight yeah. now that I mentioned it. I will look. I will, I will. Someone I know will know if I can't find it. Before we get into the issue here, which is the week of uh, August, what did I do this? August 3rd, I think, 1975? Second Second to eighth, I Second think to eighth, nineteen seventy five. I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you about what I think might have been your first TV gig, and it's one of my favorite shows, as you can imagine, being from here, Spencer for Hire. That was my first. Uh, that was a lot of firsts for me. That was my first airplane ride to a move to a job. Oh, really? Was first, that was my first hotel room <laughs> without my parents. You know, there was a lot of a lot of firsts on that one, and, and I became lifelong friends with Robert Urich. Uh, you know, he passed away way too young. Yeah. Um, and he was just a great man. And I remember we had this, and I actually, uh, my stunt double to this day, I met on that first day in, in show business, really for me, Webster Winery doubled me in the fight scene I had with Robert Urich. And so while we're shooting this fight scene in the Boston common, you know, Urich is at that time, if not the biggest TV star, definitely one of the top three and this bus and we're, you know, laying there, it's raining on us and we're muddy and it's not very glamorous, but I think it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. And this bus, school bus load of girls in whether private school or Catholic school uniforms drives by and they're, they're, they're hanging out the window squealing and screaming because they see Robert Urich. And I, <laughs> I felt like I was with the Beatles or Elvis or something. It was such a cool moment. And I turned to him and I said, wow, that must be, that must be pretty cool. And he, and he, before I got it out of my mouth, he goes, yeah, where were you when I was 15? <laughs> it was just such a cool John Wayne thing to say. And I just fell in love with the guy right there. Uh, you know, such a cool thing to say. I mean, especially in Boston, like Robert Urich was like a God, you know, he was, for, guy. He, was he was as, as popular as you could get here, not being on a sports team. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah. And uh, years later, we did, uh, not many years later, about five years later, we did Lonesome Dove together. Oh, right. And and uh, that was his proudest achievement. I mean, for many of us, I mean, it's definitely one of my proudest achievements. I mean, that thing is just such a great movie, a miniseries, six-hour miniseries. And uh, he was, you know, it was it was him and Robert Duvall and, and Tommy Lee Jones. And so that was rarefied air for him that, you know, to be in that trio. And he was so happy. And we, since, since I... I reintroduced myself. He remembered me or pretended to, <laughs> and we ended up renting houses next to each other on Lake Amistad there uh, in near Del Rio when we were filming. And, uh, or maybe that was near the Austin set. I don't remember which set it was, but anyway, I think it was near Del Rio because we were there for two months. 
we rented these cool houses. And because he was Mr. Boston, he was the spokesman for Boston Whaler. Yeah. And his deal with them was wherever he's filming somewhere, they send him a boat. So we had this cool boat with a fish finder and we'd go out on the boat and just have so much fun. And then after that, I went to a, a Boston film festival with eight men out and he came to the screening and uh, it was so cool. Like he introduced me to Dave Cowens and, oh, yeah. and Bobby Orr was there. And just like you say, like he was Mr. Boston, like he was, a, he's the biggest non-sports celebrity there at this uh, sports hall of fame thing. Oh yeah. It was uh, when I was a kid, I used to go watch them film Spencer for hire because it was, you know, you, you feel a million miles away from any sort of entertainment. And I'm sure that even on Long Island, even though Manhattan is in the same city, I guess, same state, and you have these rich people come in, it, it feels like as far away as you could possibly get from that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, I, I didn't know anybody that knew anybody in Hollywood. And, and uh, the only the closest I thing I came to celebrity was, uh, I'm a Red Sox fan because Collier Stremski is from near me on Long Island. Yeah. And there was a bar, he's from a town called Bridgehampton, and there was a bar called Billy's Triple Crown, which was, Yastrzemski was a shortstop and a pitcher in high school, like most great baseball players are. And his high school catcher never went anywhere after high school and has this bar called Billy's Triple Crown dedicated to Yastrzemski. And the legend in my town was that if you went there and you told them you were a Red Sox fan instead of Yankees or Mets, they'd give you a beer for free, <laughs> even if you were 14 years old like I was. And so we sat there and it was just funny listening to this guy you know, Yastrzemski's a god, Yastrzemski's a god, and then he got a couple of drinks in him, and he was like, I made that son of a bitch. <laughs> that bum! Me, you know? yeah, yeah. Billy's Triple Crown, I don't know if it's still there, but it was <laughs> one of the seminal experiences in Long Island. You got to go there and either declare as a Yankee or a Red Sox fan. And it sounds like that it was true. You did get a beer if you said you were a Red Sox I did. Fan. I got several, actually, because I actually was a Red Sox fan, because he usually would quiz guys and ask them who the best catcher was, and if you said Thurman Munson, you know, you weren't getting a beer. He knew yeah. that, you know, you'd say Carlton Fisk reflexively. <laughs> yeah. He's like, this is bull. You have not done the work here. This oh. is, you just got the thing. Yeah, it's it's Spencer for Hire is everything for me. I just I love that show. And and Yurik, did you watch Las Vegas or anything he had done before that? I did, like, yeah, yeah. I, I watched Las Vegas and the rookies. And you know, I mean, he was. I just thought he, you know, I never thought at that point in my life I was going to play left field for the Red Sox. I wasn't thinking about being an actor for a living. But I guess had I been thinking about being an actor, he would have been the guy I looked up to, you know, as a teenager. And and we became, like I said, great friends and golfing buddies. And we belonged to the same club in L.A. And I, I was with him right at the end. And, uh, oh. you know, we golfed about two weeks before he passed away or three weeks. And I remember the sun. It was a beautiful day and the sun was going down. And he and I remember he put his like hand on my shoulder or something. It was a little it was, I didn't know how sick he was. And he said, you know, and he said, this is such a great day. I'm glad we're having this day. And that was the last time I saw him before, you know, he was in the hospital and passing. So mm. it was just great that, you know, to get to spend so much time with him because he really was a great man. I've never heard a bad thing. And, and that's highly unusual in this business, as, you, yeah. as I'm sure you're aware. So let's dive in here. Let's go and start on Saturday night. Uh, would you, right. would you do the Saturday? This is actually the first interview I've ever done where there was homework. So I know, I'm sorry. Everyone complains. Yeah, this was, is like, a, like the SATs. I, I look, you know, I, like I said, I really enjoyed looking at the, uh, TV guide. So Saturday night would be the first controversial night in my house because my two older sisters are going to absolutely want the Mary Tyler Moore show. And I'm going to fight really hard for emergency because that's one of my favorite shows. Uh, Randolph Mantooth, I think, or is, I don't yeah, remember. Yeah. Randolph Mantooth as gauge. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I love that. I mean, I, you know, we used to walk around all week saying that. Mm, uh, uh, yeah. You know, like the start of that show was kind of iconic. And then um, at, at, uh, eight o'clock, uh, central, I'm going to go with the, uh, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis movie money from home. Cause I love horse racing and uh, I'm a comedy guy. So that would have been my choice there. And I would have, you know, stayed with that for the rest of the night. It's funny. Cause you didn't get a ton of comedy roles early on, or it took a while or that people necessarily knew you from when clearly yeah. that's what you have an affinity for. I love it the most. And, uh, but I got, you know, Francis Coppola hired me to do this, you know, m tragic movie, uh, for his family, his son died, and, and it was a tragedy to begin with. Gardens of Stone with James Caan, and I guess people thought I was good at being a serious, tragic figure or whatever. So I got several roles like that, and um, just five years ago, I got to be on Two and a Half Men, and I felt like I finally got home. Like right. this is what I was born to do, and uh, that was my first time on a sitcom after thirty years in the business. So uh, that would be my dream job now. Would be if I could find a sitcom because it was so much fun harken back to the theater days how strange was it because it, it it is like theater but it also is its own beast like it's not quite exactly the same but it's no, this it's, weird it's thing a little different but it's a cool hybrid and and john crier god bless him the first day i was there i got the job because um my son played hockey and and we played for the la junior kings and so 
not wanting to hang around, you know, the showbiz aspect of hockey. I just wanted to be a hockey dad. I'd go down by the Zamboni door and this other guy who had a kid on the team, Jim Patterson, would stand next to me. And the rink that the Kings practice in is right near, it's in El Segundo. It's not really in Hollywood. And it's by the Toyota factory. It's by the Grumman, fa- uh, the uh, Lockheed factory. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of normal people too in the hockey world. And this guy would have a Michigan shirt on most of the time and he'd stand next to me. And we would just break balls and make fun of the thing. And, and one day he said to me, wow, you're really funny. You know, he knew I was an actor. I didn't ever ask him what he did. Uh, but I assumed he worked at like Lockheed or something. Yeah. He was a normal Midwestern guy. And he said, I said, man, I would, uh, he said, you should do a sitcom sometime. And I said, well, I'd love to do a sitcom. That'd be a dream. And he said, well, I'm a writer on two and a half men. And, uh, uh maybe, maybe we can make that happen. And he was a nice guy, but I, I thought it was one of those things that people say to you five times a day in oh, LA. Yeah. Like, I wrote a script, I, this, my brother-in-law, you know, so I didn't pay it any mind. Three years later, I moved to Chicago. I get a call or two years later. And he said, Hey, DB, it's Jim Patterson. Remember me? Uh, Anyway, I just got promoted. I'm the head writer on Two and a Half Men, and I have a part for you if you'll come in and play it. And I was like, awesome. So I didn't have to audition. It was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I went in, but it was very much, you know, Jim Patterson was taking a chance because I had never done that. And, you know, and, and Chuck Lorre is the big boss, and you do this table read in front of the whole 100 people, Warner Brothers TV, casting, everybody, the whole cast, the whole crew, everything. It's a big deal. And before the table read, John Cryer told a story about a play he and I had done together in the early 80s that we, it was a, um, a two-man play. And I won't tell you the whole story that he told, but it, ends, it has a funny punchline. And, 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 but John Cryer told it right before the table read in front of all those people as a way of saying, hey, this is not just the uh, asshole of the week here. Right. This guy's okay. <laughs> this is my guy. And I haven't talked to John since we did the play 25 years or whatever oh, wow. it was. It wasn't like we were pals. But he did that. It was such a generous gesture for him to, you know, to tell that story. And it sort of it put me in a different standing. And then all my jokes got laughs, which maybe they wouldn't have had he not said he's my guy. And then we killed it on that episode that week. And that turned into 11 episodes for me. So it was yeah. so fun and, and it was a great experience. So I really appreciate John anyway. So I, I guess I got off track there. But. No, no. I mean, that's it, it's sort of a running theme in that he's another one of those guys that you know, time and time and time again, when I talk to people on the show, I've worked with them, they're like, he's just the best dude. Like, he's genuinely yeah, and, a good dude. And so good at that. I mean, sitcom is different than theater. It's different than stand-up comedy. It's somewhere in between the two. And I saw him milk more in a very organic way out of like, you know, he get a laugh on, on the, his reaction to the other person's line. He gets a laugh. Then he get a, a laugh on his line. And then he would like add a sound at the end of his line. And get So he'd get three laughs out of one line. Yeah. And make the scene so much better. And he, he really is a, a master. And Charlie Sheen rightfully got a lot of the credit for that show becoming as big as it, as it did. But I'll tell you what, John uh, was, he sort of went from being Charlie straight man to being the featured funny guy. And that's not easy to play both sides of that. Yeah, that's a huge swing. I think people like are totally different skill sets. It's a completely yeah. different skill set. He went from like Jackie Art Carney to Jackie Gleason in a right. way. And, and uh, no one could do that. Nobody can do that. But he, you know, so I have a lot of respect for John and, and his skills. Total side note the weirdest thing when I think about it, if I look at Art Carney and Jackie Gleason, one of them played Santa Claus three times. It's not Jackie Gleason. <laughs> right, right. You you'd probably get that wrong on the quiz, not knowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Art Carney's not the person I would be like, oh, yeah, that guy's got to be Santa Claus. But everything he's been in is Santa Claus, like Night of the Meek, the Twilight Zone episode, and then he did a couple right. of t- I'm like, he's great in that. Like, he just didn't get cast in it. Yeah, he really, very versatile guy. Much more versatile than Gleason. But, you know, Gleason, like Dangerfield or Sam Kinison, if you have the one incredible move you don't need to be versatile oh yeah you you have the personality and then you get propped up by really great actors around you that can right. kind of um i i had uh, Teresa gansel on and she was in the toy with gleason oh wow and she said that uh he invited her to his hotel one night and she was like, I don't know what that's about. But he wasn't staying at the same hotel as all, all the rest of the cast and crew. And she's like, well, it's Jackie Gleason. He must want like a nicer place. And they were like, no, no, he always gets the tallest hotel in the city. And she was like, why? And she goes up there and he has four telescopes set up and he was obsessed with aliens. Wow. 
And so he just wanted the highest room so he could sit and watch for UFOs all night. So he wow. was like, yeah, check this out. I'm like, that's not the Jackie Gleason story I thought I was going to hear. Oh, no, that's, I didn't see that one coming. No. That Pistol Pete Maravich, the basketball player, was obsessed with aliens. So I, I tend to hear a lot of these stories because of Fire in the Sky. Yeah. And, and it is interesting how, how many people are extremely fast. Like to me... It's one of the first, like, you know, I'm not really that impressed by politicians, but if I got to hang out with Obama or, or somebody, that's the one secret I'd want to know. Tell me about Area 51. Yeah. Tell me about the UFOs. <laughs> Is it real? You know, and I'm yeah. not sure that they, they probably couldn't tell me the truth. But <laughs> Right. They but, might but, not that, know themselves. You know, that would be the worth the thing worth knowing. That's the reason to get elected president right there. Yeah. To get the, if they tell the president, maybe they don't even tell the president. <laughs> That'd be because funny. only there four years. That might have been someone's entire presidential campaign. It's just like, I want to know about aliens. I'm going to find, gonna find out. out and I'm going to tell everybody. <laughs> That's it. I I'd Nothing else. Them. I would too, actually. I don't need to know anything else. One uh, or two voters. Yes. <laughs> Day one, we'll know exactly everything. But Far in the Sky is another one where I first, I don't know, not your first few roles, but you played a lot of real people in a bunch of movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, in Memphis Bell, I played, uh, uh, they changed the name of Chuck Layton, the navigator of the Memphis Bell, but um, I got to meet Chuck and then... Uh, and it was it didn't help me to meet Chuck because he was different than the way they wrote my character in Memphis Bell. So right. it was a little bit distracting. And so I asked when we did Fire in the Sky, I, they, um, they wanted Travis Wall to be part of it, um, you know, as, especially in helping to market the film. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's awesome, whatever you want to do. But I'd rather just make the movie and go with my imagination and my own take. And I don't want him to say something to me that's going to make it harder for me to believe him. Yeah, that was going to be my question. Like, it, it almost makes it, people would think superficially, it's easier if you meet the person, but now you're not acting so much as like doing an impression or something. Yeah, and I think uh, if you're playing somebody that everybody knows, like say if you're going to play Richard Nixon or, or, or whatever, Jackie Gleason, you know, somebody that everybody knows how they are, then there is some, you got to at least honor their mannerisms or honor some essence of them that will bring that to the audience in a way that the audience can go on with the story. But if you're playing people that are not, widely known in terms of their mannerisms or their speech patterns or anything. I don't think it really helps you to meet the real person because your imagination is usually going to be richer than reality. Yeah. Yeah. And no one's going to be like, wow, he sounds just like him. This person I've right. never heard talk before. <laughs> it's just weird. Uh, so that's Saturday night. Emergency is a show that doesn't get talked about enough. Like it, it, it reruns sort of on like me TV or something, but it's never, it never gets talked about as much as like, even like SWAT or something like that. No, you know? no. And, and Kevin Ty is another great guy. He was an eight man out. Oh, right. And, uh, and so it was great to have him around. He played sports Sullivan and, um, so it was fun. And, and a lot of us guys of a similar age, were all sort of like, he was the older guy on the set and we were like, man, that was awesome. Uh, you know, he, we all were emergency. Charlie Sheen was a big emergency fan. And, uh, so he was the number two celebrity on the set after there was a, a the woman who did our hair, uh, tipped off at some point during, you know, one of our long days of being in the makeup trailer, um, that she actually dated Elvis. <laughs> so she became the number one celebrity. She was still pretty hot. She was like in yeah. her 40s, which seemed extremely old at the time. I bet. We all thought she was, and nobody knew what a MILF was yet. <laughs> she was absolutely a MILF in that trailer. And then when we found out, and, you know, she said it in a way that we knew she wasn't making it up. Right. You know, and there was no more details forthcoming. And it was like, so we just worshipped her after that. And then Kevin Ty was in second place, I think. It's funny. There's a few people that if you know someone who met them or knew them, it feels like they met an alien or something. Like Elvis is one of them. David Bowie. Like You're like, yeah. oh, those are real guys that you could just know? <laughs> like, well, we had Studs Terkel also on 8 Men Out. Oh, and wow. Studs Terkel. He's Chicago like, royalty. Yeah, he's one of those guys too. And, and you know, I, I, I got to be friends with him. I've had so many great blessings with people that I've gotten to work with and meet and you know a couple of them got away like angelica houston i worked with her twice and she asked me and john houston is one of my favorite directors yeah. and she said you got to come meet john and, and he was actually either living or working in rhode island which you mentioned earlier and i just didn't do it i don't remember why and then he passed a few years later so he, that's the one that got away but a lot of the other ones i got to uh i got to spend time around some really cool people yeah absolutely absolutely do you have other any other favorites that come to mind other than the ones you've already mentioned i mean there's well, some good um, ones already uh I got one coming on Friday night. Okay. That, that's a good but, uh, teaser. We'll yeah. <laughs> Friday night. I got one of my favorite people I've ever gotten to meet because of show business. But so where were we were on Sunday? It's, uh, Sunday. Yes. What'd you do? So Sunday night at uh, seven o'clock, I'm going to go with this uh, CBS news special about Ireland. Yes. Ireland. You got to do it. And there'll probably be some good accents to, 
to pretend to do. It's the uh, uh, it's about the troubles, basically. About the troubles. Yep, yeah. Irish Protestants and Catholics, a tale of two Irelands. Uh, have you seen the show Bridget and Eamon? No, no. Uh, it's an Irish sitcom, and it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. It's from two, three years ago. It takes oh, wow. place in the eighties, and it's it's just so funny. Like it, it's I'm unbelievably chewing good. it up tonight. Yeah. I think you'll dig it. Um, yeah. But yeah, that stuff's fascinating, especially when I look back at these old TV guides, like seeing these news programs about historical stuff we all know about, but they're contemporary. Right. It's right. fascinating. Cause you're yeah, like, and I think that that, you know, that was, you know, being a New York Irish guy and, you know, my dad would go to this bar where I know there was IRA guys in there. And, and the crazy thing is um, uh, about, um, racial profiling. Um, so when I first started making money in the eighties, I went to Ireland because I always wanted to go there. And then I went back and then I went back again. And then I went back. I went like five times in two years. The fourth time I went, I'm coming back through John F. Kennedy airport and I get pulled out and I used to pride myself on traveling light. And I, these guys gave me the third degree. They gave me a full body search. They did the whole thing. They basically accused me of running money to the IRA. Like, because, and I remember the bar my dad used to drink called Farrell's. Um, no, not Farrell's. Uh, I can't, that's another bar. Anyway, it had some Irish names yeah, they yeah. all done together in Rocky Point, New York. They used to be, I, I'd go in there with him and he'd give me some quarters and I'd go play video games and uh, pinball. Sorry, no video games yet. And drink a Coke. I was the king of the world. And uh, uh, he would sit around and talk to his buddies and he was a guidance counselor, which is kind of a funny coincidence. <laughs> the guys in the bar were like tradesmen, you know, carpenters and just, people that work with their hands, but a guy would come in from time to time and take up a collection for, um, for the widows and children mm -hmm. is what they would say, but it was money for the IRA. So anyway, the, the, um, the guys in customs thought that I was somebody who was running those collections over to Ireland. Like, why would you go for three days with no suitcase? Right. Right. <laughs> and so anyway, so people talk about, you know, racial profiling, whatever I was profiled <laughs> yeah. you know, way before anybody else. But in a, in a way it made me feel safer because uh, I thought, Oh, somebody's thinking. Yeah. They're and, looking for this. Yeah. And, but unfortunately like when TSA came into existence, the dingbats that they hired to do that, you yeah. know, I was hoping that they were slowing us all down so that they could actually, you know, profile 20 to four military age males who are doing weird things that might end up flying yeah. into a building. Yeah. But unfortunately it was just, wasting our time and frisking grandmothers. And oh yeah. Stupid. Oh yeah. All the people I know that work at the TSA at Logan that I went to high school with, I'm like, I would not let you find anything like yeah. you are not an observant person. That's uh, funny because in my high school, the people that either, either went to college or, or you joined the military, but if you couldn't qualify for either of those two, you went to work at the nuclear power plant in my town. <laughs> so, Perfectly safe. That's but, exactly yeah. where you want them right there. Yeah. Right there. And, and all the candidates that got to work there right from the bottom of the barrel. Yep. Well, 18 bucks an hour union benefits go ahead go weld those uh fusion pipelines do you know what a meltdown is ah uh, no yeah <laughs> like just all they do is show them the china syndrome yeah <laughs> they're like you're all trained that's right. all you need yeah. cigarette cup of coffee in a new york post yep 21 dollars an hour right if over you, here if you smell something weird call this number um yeah. <laughs> i uh i'm always i think of like all the bars that i used to have to hang around with my uncles and stuff when i was a kid and it, it whenever i watch friends of eddie coyle like that just reminds me of my youth uh, great movie. but it's just like that bar that peter boyle runs that like kind yeah. of ski that's the kind of place they would take up the collections and right. It, but I watched that and I have like a weird, like, ah, oh, like a warmth for a terrible place, which is just, you know, just strange. Uh, yeah. So you're doing that seven to eight. What'd you do? At oh, I'm actually, I'm going to change over at seven 30. I'm, I'm, I'm going over to Colombo. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't miss Colombo and it's a great episode for me because the Sergeant Kramer is played by Bruce Kirby. Yes. Bruno Kirby's dad. And my very first day in front of a movie camera, I did a TV commercial for the army. And it launched my whole career in 1983 because they showed the commercial in the last minute before the Super Bowl starts. Like wow. right the kickoff. And Steven Spielberg called. All these people called my little agent that I didn't even – I had this non-existent agent in New York. But everybody was like, who's the kid in the Army commercial? <laughs> and Bruce Kirby was Bruno's dad. And he yeah. became a little sort of a mentor for me for several years after that. And, uh, and then I got to work with Peter Falk on Roommates. And Peter Falk was my mom's favorite actor. And I always enjoyed Peter Falk as well. And – he and I became really close friends and golfing buddies as well. Uh, he was a member of the Riviera Country Club in California. And, you know, we just, we became really, really close friends. And um, uh, it's, he's another guy that just uh, is underrated. You know, yeah. I mean, 
he, he became so iconic as Columbo. People forget what a great actor he was before he was Columbo. Yeah. And even after he was Columbo. And he's so good in this movie that I did Roommates, which slipped through the cracks. It didn't take off. Directed by Peter Yates, who directed Bullet. Great director and Breaking Away. And it's the first major role for Julianne Moore. Oh, wow. So, uh, she I've plays never seen that. And Diane Weist is in it. And it's, it's really, really quite a, it's very sentimental, old school kind of movie. And I think it came out like 94 or something like that. And I think people kind of dismissed it because it, it's not of its time. It's a movie that's really, uh, you know, from an earlier period of time. And the other thing they didn't like about it was that it's based on a memoir, again, with a true story of a guy. And it's a very Jewish Pittsburgh experience. And they made it Polish Catholic. Right. And so a lot of the people in Hollywood were offended by that. Uh, you know, that's okay. I mean, I, they, they have a right to be offended, but it, so I think the movie uh, it benefits from another relook. I think I think yeah. it holds up pretty good. It's, I will, I will watch Peter that. I love Peter Falk. I'll watch him in anything. Uh, yeah, he's, he's so good in this thing. Great comedic actor, and then also did some great serious stuff. I'll definitely watch that. It's funny when people get really mad about a change like that from a book, because I always look at it like, you're not adapting a book, you're translating it. Yeah. It's not a one to one. You gotta, it, you can't just film the book. Sometimes, for whatever reason, you make some changes. I think that uh, Peter Yates, uh, being a non Jewish, Peter, uh, Peter Falk, um, his wife was Jewish. I think Peter's Jewish too. But uh, anyway, it was, it was not an anti Semitic change. It was right. just sort of like, you know, they had me. They want, you know, right. they hired me. It made more sense for what you were doing instead of. Yeah, the and book. they didn't yeah. change it because of me. It was already changed. But, right. Um, I don't know. I just thought that was a weird thing, you know, but now that casting thing has gotten out of control where, you know, it's all crazy now. It's like, what well, you're only allowed to play yourself, I guess now. Yeah. So which is a little bit strange. Cause it's like kind of the whole, yeah. the whole, the whole point magic of, it, right? of acting is that you can get lost right. in a role, you know, other, not just like, Oh, we're casting you as you, uh, otherwise like I would get acting kicks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope we get back to where people, you can play different kinds of parts and, you know, because I mean, Australians come in and play Americans all the time, but now, yeah. you know, and I actually ran into this on another occasion. I did a movie in Denmark with Daniel Benzali, who was known uh, from Murder in the First, and um, Kelly Wolf, great movie, Tova Felcha. It's another, it's a movie about the Danish resistance to the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And so I played, it was four Americans and then all Danes. And when the movie came out, the Danish people freaked out. Why are we having Americans play this great Danish story? And it's like, well, so it will play in America. I mean, what, right. do, you, what do you think? It has so, to make but, some money. <laughs> yeah, but then... So the reviews in Denmark were very lukewarm and that affected the release in America. So it's just interesting how, you know, people get, sometimes people just overthink it. It's like, do you like the movie? You know, you told me right. about that thing you liked before with Eamon. Yeah. I'm going to look that up and I, yeah. I don't, I don't need to know any more about it. I need, don't yeah. need to know that that guy is from Wales right. with an Irish accent right. until I like it. And then I can look into it. Yeah. So. You look at the content, the, the actual art, <laughs> not right. necessarily what's into it is is roommates if you had to pick sort of one piece of your work that you think is underrated or underseen or that best represents what you do would that be it or would you recommend something else well i think uh i mean the cutting edge is probably the thing that i'm best known for but it, but a lot of times when people say oh i love that movie it's my guilty pleasure or or you know they they sort of say they've seen it 30 times and then they say how, you know, I know it's not that good of a movie, but I've watched it 30 <laughs> times or, or they'll say something like that. And I'm really proud of that movie. I mean, Tony Gilroy wrote it. Who's now the, probably the greatest writer in Hollywood. He is the uncredited script doctor on all these movies. Mm -hmm. he's, of course he's done Dolores Claiborne. Uh, you know, he's done so many great movies, the born identity movies. So he's one of the tops and that was his first script. And it's a really good script. And romantic comedy is probably the hardest genre. I mean, comedy is the hardest, but within that, the subset set of that romantic comedy, because you think about all the movies that flame out. I mean, when Harry met Sally is a great one. And then, you, you know, you've got to start digging around for, there's not that many great romantic comedies in the last 30 years yeah. because it requires a lot of skill from the performers and the writers and everybody. So um, anyway, so I would say that I think that movie is underrated. I mean, it's obviously very popular and iconic, but, I, sometimes I think people don't give it the credit for the craft. Right, right. They they write it off a little bit, a little too much as popcorn when it's it's a well made movie with great people in it. Like uh, yeah. I had Paul Michael Glazer on last year and um, talking to him about that same similar thing where he was just like, you know, it's 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 weird that that's the one I get uh, talked to about the most. You know, <laughs> the yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's definitely his best movie uh, that that he directed and yeah. And I think that I, I ran into him once years later and he sort of, 
I, he felt a little bit of what I just expressed that, you know, um, you know, he didn't get the, the uh, respect off of it that he felt that it, it should have gotten him. And I, I agree with him. I mean, he didn't get that many opportunities to direct other movies after that. And, you know, I, I think that that part of that is due to the fact that we all made it look so easy in that movie that yeah. you think there's no trick to it. Right. Yeah. It's like, I always say that about stand up. If someone's really, really good at it, it makes it seem like it's easy or that they're not doing anything. Cause that's right. the point. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. The point. You watch Chappelle. Yeah. When you watch Chappelle, you think, Oh my gosh, this guy is so off the cuff and everything. Yeah. No, he's not. It's, it's a whole skill set going on underneath there that you yes. don't notice. And that's why it's great. Um, so let's go Monday night. What'd you do? Monday night. I got, um, Oh, I'm, I'm going to go on, uh, I'm going to go at seven o'clock with, to be announced on Channel Six. Yep, I'm taking a shot. They're going to give me something good. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not going to be good. So at seven thirty, I'm switching over to Gunsmoke. Yeah, I mean, you know it, I can have a Gunsmoke. It's good to have that Gunsmoke in your back pocket, just in case that yeah. gamble at seven doesn't uh, doesn't pay off. Yeah, uh, that was always. It sounds stupid to people now, but like when there would be something like to be announced in there, it was kind of exciting as a kid because yeah. like, it could be anything. It anything. could be something great or it could be terrible. It's like a Going to a new restaurant. Yeah, we'll never know. Uh, Thriller was on at this time, which I believe is the one that Boris Karloff hosted. It was kind of like oh, a, yeah, yeah. A, a sort of Twilight Sony, but not nearly of that caliber. Wasn't it a spinoff of uh, Chiller? I think it may have been, actually, because like Chiller was, was the radio thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ch- well the Chiller was... Which was the one where the, the six fingered hand would come up oh, out of the blood? That's that's Chiller Theater. Chiller that, the- yeah, yeah. That was the uh yeah. I think it was Channel Nine, I think, in New York that would show okay. horror movies in that package. That would always be good. I always liked that. I, I got scared right when they did that graphic. Oh yeah. Like, Set the tone nicely. Uh yeah. and then yeah, and then Gunsmoke, which is again, the Western was the genre on television for decades and then just disappeared. Yeah. I mean you can't you can't miss with gun smoke and, uh, um, and then at eight o'clock I'm going over to SWAT, which was really one of my favorite shows. Um, it's funny how I, I, I watched one recently because I was on the new SWAT, um, as a, uh, as a guest star and, uh, was I on? No, I wasn't on it. And my friends were producing and I went and visited the set. That's crazy brain for, I was on it. I was on <laughs> it. I did one episode, but my buddies who produced, who were the line producers for me on two tickets paradise that I directed the movie. Mm-hmm. They're the line producers on SWAT. There is a lot of crossover there. You've done a lot of work. There's a lot yeah. of things in your resume. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that, that's why Jim, uh, Jim Skura and Paul Bernard, two great guys. So SWAT, but, but anyway, it, it was very low tech. Like it, I remembered it as a kid being this really vast, expansive action show, but yeah. it really wasn't. I mean, no. they, they show the fire trucks going down the street. Like that was the action sequence, you know, and, and then they'd get to a building that was clearly not on fire. They're trying to pretend it's on fire anyway. But yeah. I love that show. I love the, you know, I, I just, I, I loved it. Well, that's the thing about a lot of those shows that weren't made to be rewatched all the time because people didn't, uh, yeah. especially, you know, up until the early eighties, really, you know, they didn't expect people to be looking at it that closely where they're like, we'll just reuse that shot. We'll get some start. You know, we don't need it. They just get the idea. Yeah. Like you just didn't have to. And right. so it's, it's for, People looking at it now who didn't watch it originally, it's hard for them to get back into that mindset of how it was made, and right. they can be a little more uh, a little more critical. I, I would have gone with the Saint. I love the Saint. Roger Moore. You know what? I was never a Roger Moore fan. I was never a Saint fan. Uh, but I, I do. I like it now. But yeah. I just at the time, I just felt like who's this guy trying to pretend like he's James Bond? Who's not <laughs> right. James Bond? Right. He's not James Bond yet. We don't yeah. know he's going to be James Bond. Um, and Edward Woodward's in this episode who was in Equal. Oh, wow. Later. Oh, then I would have gone over for that because Breaker Baran is one of my favorite films. So yeah, if I, I did, I missed that in the guest cast. I would have gone just for that. Yeah, he was my bad. great. I, uh, I, Strike one for me. Well, you know, strike. the good news is you could go back and watch both now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could, yeah. Um, Tuesday night, one of my favorite all-time shows. Dynamite. Yeah. Good times. I love that show. Um, and it's so interesting, you know, in this moment we're in with racial uh, tension and everything. I never really saw it as a black show. It was just, it was that skinny guy that says dynamite, you know, yeah. and, and uh, John Amos, right. It wasn't he in it. Yeah. And, John uh, Amos was the dad. Esther, Esther Roll, I think is the name of the mom. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I just, maybe I'm really uh, putting a cherry on it in, a, in an un- dishonest way, but I don't remember thinking, I'm going to watch my black comedy now. It was kind of like, it was a family comedy. Oh yeah, they were black. It was, it's a weird thing, but now 
I don't know. I feel like we're in a weird moment in our culture that was not there in the seventies. I read it more as, you know, growing up in Boston, I didn't really interact with a lot of black people till I was older. Um, I, I'm probably similar to your experience yeah. growing up on Long Island. Totally. And so really the only exposure I had was on shows like good times. And right. I always identified with the socioeconomic part of it. Like right. these people are struggling financially. Oh, I get that. And it never really hit me till later of all the race, racial and, and race struggle things that were in it but i think that's part of the brilliant thing that norman lear did because yeah. it's all there it, it just, was kind of like all in the family yeah without without being on the nose right and having it be the other color right you know so. yeah you picked up on it without it beating you over the head it was sort of a little yeah. more subtly put in there and it's a great funny show that had some heavy episodes totally yeah i did a show with uh jimmy walker in the fall that was an interesting show really? <laughs> yeah i did uh it, in reno it was this was the lineup me jimmy walker and the unknown comic murray wow. langston <laughs> wow i remember him from yeah. uh uh gong show, gong show right yeah gong show. yeah yep it was Chuck a Ferris. very weird show uh so you're watching that at 7 30 at 7 30 7- gotta go with mash um you know i grudgingly because i thought mash was i mean later it's funny i was watching a family guy recently and and which is one of the best written shows on TV, and um, uh, Seth MacFarlane, he just threw a dig in on Mash. He was like, he was like, oh yeah, you know, doesn't it feel a little bit like Mash the last few years where it got really pretentious and preachy, and I don't know that took over. And I thought that's so funny and so true. Like earlier on, it was a great show, and then towards the end, it got very preachy and self-important. And right, and it was funny that I had a uh, family guy to point that out for me. Well, because no one ever had- says that. No one yeah. ever. You're like, you can't criticize Mash. <laughs> But it was it was much better when it was goofier and 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 they were chasing girls and drinking martinis, you know. And it was it was funny and and it, you know and that was the movie. But the movie I went back and watched that because oh, Robert Duvall is great in everything and he was great in that. And and the movie is is darker mm-hmm. and funnier. Yeah. And the show got a little yeah, I don't know luxury, but I got to watch it because yeah. nothing else is on. The show kind of split the difference. It was like we can't do both together, so we'll do some sometimes and some the other time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll never oh, mix it. And uh, at eight o'clock, uh, I'm going outside and I'm shooting hoops. Uh, there's nothing there for me. So <laughs> no Barnaby Jones. <laughs> I was a big basketball, a driveway basketball player, and I did that three hours a day. So honestly, you know, I didn't watch TV seven days a week anyway. So for me, it was like, wow, I didn't live this life of watching. I mean, I might, you know, I might watch Emergency like once a month, but it was still one of my favorite shows. You know, right. it wasn't. You know, I, I watched more TV like in the afternoon was Little Rascals and. Abbott and Costello, and those were my shows. Yeah, but I would always see Columbo because my mom never missed it. And there were certain shows, you know, like I mentioned when we talked. Uh, Rap Patrol was a favorite of mine, which is yep. was in syndication, I think, by then. So, but you know, so anyway, I'm going outside. But but uh, on Wednesday night at seven o'clock, I'm going with Tony Orlando and Dawn. Yeah, because Jimmy Walker's on. Yep. as a guest star, and um, and I met Tony Orlando and Dawn. I met Tony Orlando at one point. I wrote the first movie I ever wrote was called flesh eaters from Jersey. And it was, I won't tell you the whole story, but um, the main character, I named him Tony and his girlfriend. I named Dawn as a tribute to Tony Orlando and Dawn because they were, they were so Jersey. Yeah. That I thought it was kind of a good inside joke. And I told him that as an homage and he got a little miffed. <laughs> <laughs> like he sees himself as like more like Tom Jones, right. you know, like, I'm international. <laughs> yeah. He didn't think that he was like this kitschy icon. But anyway, I, I don't remember why, why I met him, but it was early in my career and I was in a limousine with Tony Orlando. I thought, this is so cool that I can tell him I wrote a movie and named it after him. I didn't expect him not to like it. <laughs> That's Tony Orlando's version of, I know it's not the best movie, but I love The Cutting Edge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> I didn't mean to diss him, but I did. Yeah, I'm sure he's used to it. They, what a weird lineup in this episode. And and that's the other thing I always talk about is, I guess America's Got Talent, sort of technically a variety show, but variety shows in the 70s. They were every everybody had one. It was, oh, it was uh, everywhere. It and, was great. That was people were more talented then. You can't have variety shows anymore because you know, for every guy like you know me or John Cryer who's done plays and theater and or you know, nobody can dance anymore. Really, yeah. I mean, it, on Dancing with the Stars, they all practice it, but you know, it would be nothing for you know John Wayne didn't dance, but I saw John Wayne do variety shows where he do comedy bits, and you know, so you had to be you know you had to get out there and you watch it on Saturday Night Live now and. I think people are really revealed on that show of how limited talent is these days. Yeah. From the musical guests to the, the hosts where they, you know, they, they can't 
play characters very most of them you know they can't and nobody knows their lines they're all reading off yeah. the cue cards it's like they had cue cards back in the day in those variety shows too but nobody looked at them or, or, you know, yeah. or they look at them when they got lost it but, was a fail safe it was like yeah. if we absolutely need to pull the cord we have them but they're not yeah, yeah. But, but you would have the pride of rehearsing and getting it down and having a character and sure it's a sketch show but so anyway yeah i mean i really do miss those good ones it um, was it was crazy to see like William Conrad doing a song and dance on Donnie and Marie or yeah. like Dolph oh. Sweet singing, you know, you're like, well, they, yeah. yeah, they could do all that. And even if it, even if they weren't great at it, they were a game. They were right. all gaming. Yeah. And, uh, or they might sing a song, sing a duet. And, you know, I, I love all that stuff, but eight o'clock going with Mannix, Mike Connors, underrated show. Um, great hair. The guy had yeah. great hair. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember much else about the show, but I do remember that, you know, it's it's a whole genre that doesn't exist anymore, but you know the 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 single combat detective. Now yeah. every show on TV is every crime is solved by a committee, and the, the committee of the United Nations cast. And it's and, and and the funniest one to me is I did I did three episodes, two episodes of major crimes, and then I had done one episode of the of the closer with Kira Sedgwick, who I love. And that show to me is the funniest, dumbest version of this, where it's like nine guys can't figure it out, yeah. but one smart woman. And it's every episode is the same thing. And like one of the guys will have a good day and come up with a little fragment of something that then Kira Sedgwick or Mary McDonald will run with and solve the crime. And it's just so funny because every show is the same. It's like these nine blithering idiots can't get it, but one good woman. And it's like, all right, but those shows work. That's why people tune in. They're like, I know what I'm getting every week and I'm gonna, yeah. and if they didn't, you know, once you set the, uh, set the pattern, they're like, that's what I want. Yeah. This genre I've heard the seventies sort of single detective genre. I've heard referred to as the, the defective detective genre. I love it. That's great. They and, each and have always like on the wrong thing. side of the cops. Right. Yeah. And he's always, you know, and he's got an ex wife or he's got a drinking problem, whatever Kojak, yeah. all of these, well, I guess Kojak was a cop, but, but um, there are a lot of them, you know, and, and even and it would bleed over into the cop genre where the cop show was mainly about one cop and everything was in support of that. And I, I really miss that because it was a much more of an opportunity for a character study than these committee shows like the NCISs and the CSIs. Those shows are so deadly boring that, you know, you never really, you know, it, it feels like it leaves the plot in order to give you character as opposed to the character is the plot. Yeah, this, the cynic in me thinks that that's a network thing where they go, if we pin <coughs> this whole show around one actor, if they want to leave, we're screwed. Whereas with these shows, we can interchange. Someone leaves, we replace them. We put them back in and we could still keep doing this show forever. With It doesn't matter who's on it. I, I think feel you're like, right. Yeah. I, I saw that up close and personal with Criminal Minds. And, uh, you know, of course, Joe Mantegna became the glue on that show. But it started out, Mandy Patankin was the star of that show and just flamed out. And then, you know, Shamar Moore came in, Thomas, you know, they, they, I definitely think that's a part of it that they discovered. But I think that uh, the, the reason those shows went away is because, you know, I mean, actors aren't as good as they used to be. And, yeah. and, it, and you've got to be a really good actor. You've got to be a Telly Savalas or a Carl Malden. Well, I don't get ahead of Carl Malden, but he's yeah. coming up. But Yeah, um, I mean, that's the thing I was going to mention this earlier, too, when you were talking about Lonesome Dove, is that you were a TV actor or a movie actor. And if you were a TV actor at the beginning of your career, you're, you're we're trying to move up to movies. And right. if you're an older guy, you would move back down into TV. So a lot of those cop shows, like in detective shows, it was a movie actor who was right. a little bit past his movie prime, but was now on TV. But he had those chops of having been like a, you know, yeah. real, you know, real movie actor. And, right. you know, we don't have, for better or worse, we don't have that now. Because you can kind of just, it doesn't really matter anymore. But I think people who live that life, they they brought something to it when they came back. Yeah, I think, yeah. And it's, it's you know, our culture has changed and, you know, everybody's, it's going to be hard. You know, if you're going to have that guy, it's going to have to be Denzel Washington. You know, he, he's a great actor. I don't think, it's a lot of work to do the hour long TV show if you're yeah. in every scene. Like I've done it a couple of times where. A strange you know, luck, right? Was it strange the- luck where you're in every scene and that's a long week. And then Harsh Realm, I was in almost every scene of that. And at the same time we were doing Harsh Realm, they were still doing X-Files. And that show became such a grind. They actually split up Mulder and Scully and had them uh, only one of them on set at a time. Right. And they talk on the phone. Yeah. And that was a new uh, way of getting through the week, uh, you know, so you didn't burn out your actors. But I would be up for the challenge if somebody wanted to, especially now with the 
10 episode seasons that they do. Kiefer Sutherland, I guess, is the last one in 24. 24, yeah. And he's great at it. And, you know, but they, if they find good villains and they can keep a guy, give a guy a day off once a week, you know, not burn him out. But, you yeah. know, I do, I really do miss that because a lot of my favorite shows are in that genre. You're making a movie every week. I mean, that's yeah. a lot of work. <laughs> is that everything on Wednesday? That's Wednesday. And then Thursday night at seven. I got nothing. I, I think I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go play Battleship with my brother. That makes sense. Uh, and uh, and then at eight o'clock, one of my favorites because of Carl Malden, Streets of San Francisco. And and when I watched this as a kid, I didn't know what nepotism was, but I I, I learned what it was later because I always thought Michael Douglas sucked on this show. He does. And 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 but Carl Malden was so good that he made it. He made it work. And it was and you know he's in one of my favorite movies of all time, Patton. And, uh, he, you know, it's amazing how, what he brought to that role in Patton and he's one of those actors, you know, on the waterfront, anywhere you put him, he makes the other guy, the best, the other guy ever was Marlon Brando, mm-hmm. Michael Douglas and George C. Scott give their best performances opposite Carl Malden. And I'm sure there's another five, if I got out IMDB that I could add to that list that I'm just not thinking of right now, but what, what, what a talent Carl Malden and, and, you know, like. I mean, it's almost like the, the basketball analogy. Like he is John Stockton. He is just feeding the ball. Yep. He's the assist. And, yeah. And it's, and it's, a, it's another one of those dying arts. And I've always wanted to be that kind of an actor. And I pride myself now that I feel like not to the level that he got to do because he worked with bigger talents than, you know, that I've working at this point in my career. But, you know, I feel like it's, if you can set the other guy up, if you can make the other guy look good or girl, you know, that I feel like that's, that's something to take pride in oh yeah every the whole work uh benefits from it so everybody gets uh, a benefit yeah. from it it's not just one person shining out. it's it's not quite being a character actor but you're not a lead either it's like a weird yeah. unique play like i think of like gene hackman is like a guy right. who had fallen into that or like brian dennehy or someone like gene that hackman, unbelievable well he's one of my favorites and, and you know he just got tired of it i guess but i wish he would do one more before he passes and i I don't even know what his health is, but there is a real art form to, to doing that also, which involves off camera acting, which, you know, when I, when I started out, I was coming from theater and I, I didn't really see a difference between off camera and on camera. And except that you stand near the camera and do your side of the scene. Um, but I started to see that actors didn't consider that part of the work. Oh yeah. They won't like, even do it. They're just feeding lines. You're feeding lines. And it's like, no, you gotta, you gotta keep the scene alive. And, and so I really pride myself now because after directing movies, I understand sometimes if it's a younger actor, I know I can, I can mix something up in a way to get a reaction from them that's respectful. And I'm not trying to trip them up. I'm trying to mix them up in a way that it comes out in a fresh way that I know the editor is going to use. And I, you know, the other actor has to trust me. So you have to build up this relationship, but I take a lot of pride in that, in that side of the scene. Um, and, and, you know, doing my, my work off camera. Yeah, it's, I hear horror story after horror story. You know, it's more stuff like people I know who are on moonlighting or something like that, where they're like, Oh yeah, no, you would do your scene with both of them. You were the only person in the room. You don't know when they shot their stuff. No one came in. Like it was just like, yeah. yeah. And Robert Duvall told me a story that Klaus Maria Brandauer was like that. They did this movie called The Light Ship or something like that. And Duvall told me, you know, I've worshiped Robert Duvall. He's the greatest actor I've ever worked with. And incredible fascinating person in every way and so i would t- t- pick his brain without being too much of a pain in the ass and he told me that klaus maria brandauer was so pathological about that that if duval was in a good take sometimes brandauer would like push push him so he'd be out of focus like he'd push him off his mark like he'd ruin the take literally and then and then duval was like so he said i'm not that guy's not coming on set when i'm working yeah yeah that's but imagine a- you know, he's so intimidated by Duval that he was trying to make him worse so he could be better. Could you imagine someone doing that like <clears throat> an office setting? Like someone's doing a PowerPoint presentation, it's going really well, and like someone's like, uh, "How does it push him?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, pull the plug out of the pull the plug out of the projector yeah, or something. You like you, that. You, yeah. you get fired. One thing I want to mention before we move to Friday: there's a show here called Almost Anything Goes. <laughs> I saw that one, <laughs> and it's a it's. I think it must be sort of combining the love of evil Knievel in 1975, which cannot be underestimated (laughs) with, with a game show. So this is stunts include bicyclists racing around a track while members of their teams try to ladle paint into the cyclists hats. 
the living donut in which several inner tubes are thrown over contestants' bodies, after which they race down a course to their teammates who roll them back, and a swimming relay rally in a pool filled with peanuts. <laughs> That's just weird. That's crazy. I mean, can you imagine the... Uh the waiver that those contestants had to sign even in those days, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look at stuff like, um, even they brought it back recently, but like battle of the network stars, like circus of the stars yeah. and stuff. I'm like, they don't even let people do their own stunts. You telling me no. they're going to let this person be a high wire act. <laughs> Not anybody that's got any value. Like American gladiator is always some trainer from uh, Brockton, Massachusetts or right. something. You know, like, you know, it's never anybody, you know, they could, I, I guess even if they got killed, the, the, they could probably, settle out of court for five hundred thousand right, dollars you know, like right if you kill Kiefer sutherland he's you know his descendants are going to own cbs yeah oh yeah they're like that's our cash cow forever yeah. uh so where were we so that's thursday friday night, final night of the week and this is where this is where the story we teased earlier yeah. is coming. well well the the first show is another is another one of my all-time favorites sanford and son red fox um uh, oh here's a big one here's the big one <laughs> i mean he, i mean he he did that every week and it was always funny. And I just thought, and I, you know, again, all these shows and I watched them, I was a civilian. I wasn't, I never did plays or anything. I did one as a senior in high school, but I was always looking at this, like literally from as an audience member, but I always remember thinking, man, that guy is really good at, he's just really good at it. Like yeah. Red Fox, like, and I didn't know anything else about him except he was on that show. And I just thought, I like to meet that guy. I think he's good. I like watching him every week. And Fascinating guy too. Like he was cellmates with Malcolm X. They were really good oh, buddies. Wow. They were that. in jail together and they were like lifetime friends because they wow. were both called Red because they had red hair, like in the neighborhoods they grew up in. And then Red Fox had some of the biggest selling albums of all time, but no one ever knew because it was this weird underground dirty records thing. Like it's just fascinating. Wow. The life he had that. yeah, before he gets on this show that everyone knows it from. And all of a sudden he's... He's this huge star. I wonder 60%. if that was part of the inspiration for. Did you see that Eddie Murphy movie Dolomite is my name? Yes. Yeah. 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 I wonder if maybe this. That sounds like what you're talking about. Red Fox is maybe part of that inspiration. Yeah. Well, Rudy Ray Moore, who that movie's based on, was part of that whole scene. It was. It was mostly a black phenomenon, but there were three or four of these acts that would do these dirty. They call them party records. You know that pe people uh, would pretend they didn't know, it, and then they'd have everyone over the house, and you'd listen to this dirty comedy record. And Rudy Ray Moore was this guy who decided he was going to take it a step further and write and star in his own Kung Fu movies also. Awesome. <laughs> and he used to do his own trailers. So like he, yeah, it's just amazing. Like those I wish that movie had been somebody else other than Eddie Murphy. Cause it, it, it was, it was like a great idea that never fully bloomed in that movie. And, and it had some good scenes, but, it just needed more. I don't know. I think I, I, sometimes with a movie like that, when the star is too big, you can't believe them as the person they're playing. Right. So it, you can't fully invest yourself, maybe. You know, I, I thought that should not have been a comedian either. I thought it would have been better if they had had uh, like a, an African-American actor who's not known for comedy. I just think it would have been better because then when he was bad at the comedy, it might have been better. Because like yeah. Eddie Murphy trying to be bad at comedy... It's still funny on a certain level. It's hard to do. If you're a yeah. comedian, it's hard to do bad comedy. Or it's hard to do bad acting on part. Like, right. it, like one of the most impressive things I see is like when Catherine O'Hara is playing a part where she's a bad actor. And I'm like, she's so good at that. Cause that's, that's not easy to do if you're a good yeah. actor. <laughs> well, she's, she's gifted. Yeah. It's like, man, how would you do that? So that's seven o'clock. And then what are you doing at eight? Eight o'clock. Uh, I'd say probably, if not my favorite show, one of my all time favorite shows, Rockford Files. Uh, with James Garner, and uh, you know, I got to know him. I got to work with him on uh, Fire in the Sky. Oh, that's right! Um, I forgot he was in that. Yeah, and it was it was a great lesson. You know, I, I was you know I've become a filmmaker, but I was always interested in being a filmmaker and stu and studying the medium and everything. And Fire in the Sky, I learned some great lessons. Like um, when I saw the movie, they uh, it wasn't released yet. I, I saw it, the director showed it to me, and I said, "You can't have forty minutes." of the audience knowing it's true and James Garner thinking it's not. So I said, we can find out later in the movie that it didn't happen. That's fine. But you got to do something in the first part of the movie so that the audience is thinking, wait, James Garner is on his way to figuring this out because he's yeah. James Garner. He's Maverick. He's Rockford. And if you make Rockford wrong, and I, I didn't really know how to articulate this well enough at the time to get them to change it. But I, my idea was, first of all, you cut the shot. You probably don't remember the movie as clearly as I do, but it was an objective shot of my character getting hit by the alien thunderbolt. Oh, yeah, yep. 
it's not from anybody's point of view. So that says to the audience, this happened. Right. Because it's an objective shot. I said, take that shot out. They didn't want to take it out because it was an expensive shot. Right. And I said, just show the shot. Show it. that. That's like the poster view. shot almost, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. So they're yeah. like, yeah. Totally. And I said, have that shot be from somebody's point of view in the truck because the whole movie is about interrogations and points of view. And I said, you could save this movie if you, Craig Sheffer was like the skeevy guy. Mm -hmm. And Craig's a great guy. We've done three movies together. Awesome dude. I really like him. And uh, he he's a really skilled guy as well. And I said, just do one shot of like Craig Sheffer with like two gas cans in his hands, like sneaking up the hill at sunset. And then somebody sees it. What's he doing? Yeah. And, and like, cause maybe the explosion or whatever was. You plant Craig that seed Sheffer. of doubt. Yeah. Just so that the audience can be with James Garner because he's, th he's like, there's no way Rockford's going to get it wrong. Yeah. So, and the audience is going to feel cheated. And so, and also it's, it's just dead narrative space in the movie. You already showed the audience that it happened, and now you're spending all this time with lie detector tests and all this other stuff. We already know it happened. Let's get yeah. to what happened. Yeah. You know, so anyway, so and and a big part of that was because if you want that to be the movie, that there's going to be, we know it happened and the cop is wrong, don't cast James Garner. Yeah. Cast somebody else. Cast somebody who's like somebody who's incompetent or, you know. Or, you're so bringing anyway, a gravitas to that role casting <clears> him. And like we were saying before, like, yes, it's great if people can get completely lost in a role and there are people that we see in movies that were like, oh, wow, that was him. You know, if it's like uh, Gary Oldman or something, you're like, I didn't even know that was him. But yeah. James Garner's not one of those guys. James no. Garner's a guy that you cast for a very specific role because you want James Garner. You want he's the gonna, coolest he's guy. He's going to get his man. He's yeah. going to get his man. So if he doesn't get his man and he's wrong. It's it's a bad feeling. It's yeah. a bad feeling for the audience subliminally or unconsciously. So that was a lesson for me as a filmmaker. You know, that's why when I put Ed Harris in my movie, Two Tickets to Paradise, he's got a critical plot point. Like his scene, he's only going to be in one, two scenes, but he's going to give us something that pays off big time at the end of the movie because he's Ed Harris. Yeah. And so we created Brian Curry and I, great guy who wrote the movie, who then went on to write Green Book. Um when uh, when we wrote the movie, it was like we gotta we have to write a scene where because all three guys are gonna go their separate ways and then re meet up thirty pages later at this bar. But the only reason they all end up with this bar is because that's the bar Ed Harris said was the best bar in Florida. Right, right. And so it's, and and Ed Harris is right. Yeah. When you get there, it's the best bar in Florida. So anyway, so I, that lesson was applied from Fire in the Sky, where if you have a if you're lucky enough to have an incredible iconic actor, don't piss them away. Yeah. You know, give them something to do that pays off. So uh, and use the but, gravity they have to your benefit. Yeah, the so, audience is yeah. sitting on the front of their seat now because Ed Harris. Ed Harris only has one arm and he's talking. You know, yeah. so the original Tiger King, by the way, in my movie is Ed Harris. So if anybody <laughs> has seen two tickets to paradise, throw it in. It's really the movie holds up great. And uh, John C. McGinley from Scrubs and and uh, you know, it's I think it's a really strong movie. And Moira Kelly yeah. is in it. So that's the only time we've worked together since Cutting Edge. Um, but I, the th one thing I loved about the Rockford Files was, uh, well, I love many things about it, but I just loved, obviously the song was great, Yeah. but it just had the feeling like, you know, that James Garner was like, his back was sore that he was, oh, yeah. that he was, you know, that it was, that he really needed the money and he had to take the case and he had to, but once he took the case, I'm getting through it. You yeah. Know, and I love that. He never felt like a loser, <laughs> but he, he was always a victim of circumstance. And he, he best exemplifies that Hitchcock quote, an audience will love any character that's good at their job. So yes. he was bad at everything else. He was a bad husband. He was bad with his money. He's bad at everything. But when it comes to his job, what he does on the show, he's the best. And so that's what makes that character so endearing. Cause you're like, he's sleeping on the beach or whatever, but right. you, you recognize that he's so good at being a detective. Yeah. It was, it was like you said earlier, it was, a, it was definitely that genre, the defective detective. But to me, the Rockford files was the best of the genre and, uh, and the best of many genres. Like, yeah. And you know, it's, it was really great to get to know, uh, Jim, uh, everybody called him Jim. And, you know, he was, his health was already starting to fail when we did fire in the sky. And, you know, we had some young bucks in there that, you know, me and Robert Patrick and uh, and Peter Berg was still an actor at oh, that right. point. I'm a filmmaker, but he was always an aspiring filmmaker. You could see, you know, he was always talking about lenses and, and angles and things way more than I was at that time. I was more interested in, uh, you know, the acting side of it still and, and writing, but he was interested in the filmmaking. Anyway, so the three of us were would go golfing and James Garner had 
uh, uh, artery problems in his legs, so he couldn't walk very much. But he was like the four-time club champion at Bel Air Country Club. I mean, he was oh, yeah. stud on the golf course, and he just kicked our asses all over the <laughs> golf course. He could barely walk to his ball, and, he, and I think he shot seventy-five one day, where he could. He had a flag on his cart, like a handicap flag, because he couldn't. He was driving right up yeah, to the yeah. green. You know, just up and down, par, par, birdie, par. You know, it was, and we were like, "Damn, man, we supposed to be kicking his ass." Yeah, nope. And he's like half trying. He's like, "Yeah, all right, kids." Yeah, I think he could have embarrassed us worse, actually. Yeah, he did you a favor. He didn't want to make you feel bad on your on your movie. Great guy, great, great example of how you know everywhere he went, people would recognize him, and he was always super gracious. And uh, he understood that if somebody came over to him, we were shot that movie in Oregon. And there was a little town called Oakland, Oregon. And we spent a lot of time there and people started to figure out James Garner's in this thing and they'd come around and they'd have a picture or they'd try to take pick a picture with him and, or get an autograph. And he understood that, you know, that it was one of the biggest moments of these people's lives yeah. to meet him. And he'd never shortchanged anybody. And it was, there, and he did it in such a self-effacing way, but he, he understood that for this 60 year old woman, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to her. Yeah, and to not let that make your head oversized and give them what they want is a, is an art form that he had mastered. It's so it's it's something I appreciate so much whenever I meet people because it's it's a tiny moment of their day, but for that person they're meeting, that's their story now. Like right. you, that one minute interaction, like that's their story for everybody. And yeah. you know, our, and people have bad days, and like it's it's awful if you're having a bad day and someone comes up, but it's like it's. It's such a uh, the weight of that on you all the time, it, right? Especially someone like him, who's it's for decades, you know. Um, yeah, and it's, it's it's in a way it's it's worse now because you know people didn't. If you were at a bar at eleven o'clock at night thirty years ago, nobody had a phone, uh, nobody right. had a camera. Right now, everybody has a camera all the time, and everyone yeah. wants to take a selfie all the time. So, you know, maybe you don't have a good hair day going, or or you've had a couple of drinks or whatever, but people get expect you to take a picture with them wherever they find you. Yeah. So yeah. it's Paul Newman uh, wouldn't sign autographs. And, and I think I heard Ringo Starr stop signing autographs at a certain point in his life, too. Paul Newman used to say to people, uh, when they come up to him and say, would you give me an autograph? He'd say, no, but I'll buy you a Coke. Would you like a Coke? And 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 then he would give them two minutes of his time. But he doesn't want it. And, and the ironic thing was he was doing it because the other 40 people in the room see the guy not get an autograph. They don't come over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was pretty smart, actually. And, uh, but he wasn't trying to be mean about it. I, I got to know, I sound like such an idiot name dropper. but No, no, that's that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my, I spent some time around Michael Jordan mm -hmm. in the 90s when he was, you know, Michael Jordan with a capital M and a yeah. capital J. And obviously, with The Last Dance, he still is. I mean, he's a fascinating figure. And I got to spend some time around him. And, um, you know, and, and he has the additional complexity of being 6'6", six, six, and, yeah. you know, striking African-American guy with bald head and you know, so there's, he can't hide anywhere. No. So he, but what I saw being around him playing a little golf or whatever, um, he could sign autographs from the minute he wakes up in the morning to the minute he goes to bed and still every, nobody's happy. Yeah. I mean, there's people that aren't happy. He didn't get to everybody. Yeah. So, you know, I saw him have to do boundaries of, I'm not signing now. And he'd have people that would just say, he's not signing now. Yeah. And because otherwise he'd never get a fork in his hand. You oh, know yeah. I mean? You got to live your life. It's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's a, that Newman story is amazing because the, the the experience of someone if they got to sit down for two minutes and have him buy a Coke is infinitely better than having a napkin signed by him. But totally. it's true that most people probably are like, eh, no, I don't want... Because it's not... For a lot of those people, it's not about the interaction. They just want to have like... It's almost like a... Uh, An artifact. Yeah, it's like a challenge Ooh. coin. They're like, yeah. I made it to the thing and I got to... Right. And, and it's it's weird. It's a weird uh, I think impulse. It is weird too. I, I never got into autographs. and uh, I mean, I have a few cool things that... Like Jack Nicholas uh, signed a picture of me. I was at his golf club. We had a picture together and I got it back to him. So I have had people... And Joe Namath was in my... My Broadway debut was in the Kane Unit Corps Marshall and I was... And I became good friends with Joe Namath. And so I have him sign the picture of me and him right. in the play together. And you have a personal connection there, though. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and uh, Tommy Lee Jones signed my copy of Lonesome Dove. So, you know, but I would never, I don't know. I just, even before I was in Hollywood, I never thought, why would, I, I, first time I went on an airplane, went to Los Angeles with my family to go to Disneyland. I was like 13. And my dad said, hey, go get that guy's autograph. He's an actor. And it was Martin Balsam. And, uh, and so I remember I had a good and plenty box. And I went over and I said, could I have your autograph? And he kind of looked at me. I think he knew I had no idea who he was. And he, and he, he signed the box. And I kept it for like three months. And then it, 
it had no meaning and no value to me. I was like, yeah, you know, so it was a weird thing. And, uh, so maybe that cured me of autographs very young. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember as a kid, I was, <coughs> I was at the beach and Dennis Eckersley was there, Oh, nice! Uh, but, uh, you know, my uncle was like, go get that guy's autograph. And I, I was little, I don't know who he was. And so I went and asked him and he goes, uh, I'm with my family, you little dick. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, I didn't know who this was. You made me go over there. He's not happy about it. Like nobody's happy about it. Like I just don't bother people. That was like the lesson I wow. learned there. It wow. was like you know, there's a I time and place. That. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was in, in hindsight much better story than if I had gotten an autograph right. and more keeping in character. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes it's better. Do you mention it before with two dumb mixes? That's the latest thing you've done, right? Yeah, well, I have another movie coming out, okay. I think next month called the Manson brothers, midnight zombie massacre. Okay. <laughs> a wrestling movie that morphs into a zombie movie. It's a comedy directed by Max Martini, who we did harsh realm together. Yep. Um, a really good friend of mine. And, uh, Jada Marcus, who's the bass player from Rascal Flats, is a good friend of mine. He's in it. Okay. And Randy Couture is in it. It's like a very random kind of cast. Yeah, yeah. It's really funny. And uh, I really like it. And it was written by these two guys, Mike Carey and and uh, and his partner, Chris, were both professional wrestlers. Uh, not like uh, – they had a whole wrestling circuit that I didn't even know about, like in the 80s and 90s, like, like dinner theater wrestling. But yeah. These two guys were in it, and they made a living. And so this movie kind of calls back to that experience where they play wrestlers – in that world and it becomes a zombie movie it's pretty funny i'm sold and, uh, <laughs> yeah it, it's it's different it's very different so <laughs> you're gonna make a sequel uh about uh, to it and it hasn't even come out yet so <laughs> but, but actually i filmed that just before i did two dumb mix and hopefully once this covid restrictions lift sean and i are going to do more episodes of two dumb mix um i i really am looking forward to working with him again and and i wrote the i wrote the first thing kind of you know knowing his vibe but then after we filmed this and after i edited it now i really get his character even better yeah so i think the subsequent episodes are going to be even better i loved it and i'll put a link up to it on the site uh well thank you so much for doing it. it's been great talking to you yeah this is great I, I can see why you've had such great response to these things because it's a little different and it's and it's fun There you go. Great dude. Uh, rewatch Two Tickets to Paradise or watch it for the first time. I put up links to the Two Dumb Mix episode that's up on YouTube that DB uploaded there. Uh, it's very funny. Sean Astin, always great to watch. It's a, it's a cool little show and hopefully it gets to do some more soon. I will be doing more TV Guidance Counselor episodes soon as I always am. So we have more great guests. And again, I am taking every suggestion for a guest that you get to me to heart and attempting to get everybody that you request for better or worse. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't always work out, but I'm at least trying trying and uh the lockdown has unleashed my uh my booking status and I, again i am a one-man band here it's i book the show i uh i do everything because uh, partly because i'm a control freak but also partly because who who else is going to do it really it's just me uh and you're just you and we're just we and i am slowly <laughs> losing my mind here talking into the abyss during lockdown so we'll be here next week i say we but it's just me uh well i mean other people live in my house but Anyway, be here next week. We'll have a new episode. That's the bottom line. And I'll see you next time for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. This is actually the first interview I've ever done where there was homework.